So my name is Abby McAllister. I'm a wildlife education and outreach specialist, specialist for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And that's kind of a mouthful. So what is it exactly that I do? Well, I do wildlife education in general, and it's my job to help educate the public of Southeast Alaska, as well as statewide, uh, on any important wildlife related topics that the Department of Fish and Game feels that the public needs to know about. I do everything from things like this to wildlife safety. I'm a wildlife safety certified instructor to skills-based classes, such as becoming an outdoor woman or Alaskans afield. I also go into the schools and help teach hunter education. I also do a lot of bear safety um, and virtually anything else that uh, pops up that we really feel like the public should know about. Uh, before coming to this job, I was a journalist and I reported for uh, the Juno Empire. I also edited and wrote for the outdoors section. And um, I did that job for about 11 years before leaving to go to this job uh, with Fish and Game in 2015. And I've been here ever since. Lori, go ahead, I'll let you go. My name is Lori Lamb. I'm an assistant director here at Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center. I've been out here full time since 2012 and part time some winters prior to that. So I've been in Juneau quite a while. I also have experience working for the Forest Service as a naturalist on the Alaska Marine Highway System, which was one of the most amazing jobs ever. Been a biotech for the Forest Service, um, doing surveys on plants and surveys on fish. So most of my career is centered around both observing plants and wildlife and talking to people. And I love making the connection between the two, helping people see things they might otherwise miss and then watching their eyes light up. <laughs> so tonight, thank you, Lori. So tonight, Lori and I are gonna take turns presenting and uh, I'm gonna start off and then I'm gonna hand it off to her and we'll kind of go back and forth. Okay, so again, this is watching wildlife safety. How to view bears and other wildlife in coastal Alaska with safety in mind. What are some tips and tricks? And then we'll also talk a little bit about general bear safety. Say you're out for a hike, what are some things to keep in mind? They are a little bit different and we will distinguish between the two. And then we'll talk a little bit about things to know for urban life. Uh, bears do show up in our cities and towns. And then we'll talk a little bit about moose safety and we will just briefly touch on wolf safety because all those, um, those are some different things to keep in mind with those other species as well. Okay, tonight our goal, we have three main goals, to increase overall wildlife viewing safety. We really would like to help reduce risks in bear, moose, and wolf country. And this presentation is going to have a very heavy emphasis on critical thinking and personal responsibility. And otherwise, like Lori, mentioned earlier as we were chatting, no situation ex is exactly the same and it will take a little bit of critical thinking on your part and you really are responsible for the outcome of some of these encounters for sure. So to set the scene, this is, this is an aerial shot of Juneau, Alaska and many coastal cities around Alaska look a lot like this. It's a little blip of urban life on a really big landscape. Many of these coastal cities are butted right up against the ocean with huge mountains on either side. And uh, what this does is, you know, in general, we're surrounded by a whole lot of wilderness. And this wilderness is very high quality wildlife habitat. It has very strong runs of salmon, which attract bears, wolves, um, those prey species, or rather those predator species, prey on things like, like moose. Uh, so it's important to, as we kind of zoom in to where we live, understand what's around us. It really does help us understand why we have these, this wildlife so close, um, literally in our backyard. Neighborhoods in Alaska look a lot like this. This is an aerial view zoomed in on the uh, valley section of Juneau, where we have some pretty high density residential areas. But as you can see in these residential areas, there are a lot of green patches that move um, in between the homes and in between the neighborhoods. Wildlife love these. These are travel corridors for wildlife. And uh, so that's why it's not uncommon to see 
wildlife in your backyard quite literally because they have these opportunities to move move between houses virtually undetected. Now we're going to zoom in even further to uh, the upper part of the Mendenhall Valley uh, to the Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center. And this is a really unique wildlife viewing area. Because Lori is an expert on this area, I'm going to let her uh, take, um, take this section and I'm going to go ahead and give her control of my screen. Go ahead, Lori. So one of the things I hope you're noticing as you're looking at this picture of Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center area is we are surrounded by beautiful bear habitat and the human portions of this, the pavement for the parking lots and the visitor center itself are really just small pieces in that habitat. And in spite of the fact that our human footprint out here is relatively small, over the course of a year in 2019, for example, we get around 620,000 visitors. This includes people from across the globe. It includes people who live just a mile or two down the road from us. So we're a pretty popular site. So how we behave here can affect the experience of bear viewing here. Now, if you take a close look at this particular image, you should be able to see there's some trails in the area. Right off of those parking lots, you could park your car and in five minutes be on a fantastic viewing platform where you can watch sockeye salmon in the late summer, coho in the fall, bears as they come to fish for the salmon. If you're lucky and you're paying attention and looking up in the cottonwood trees or spruce trees, you might see a porcupine. We'll see bald eagles out there. And as you look around every once in a real once, occasional while, you might see a moose. In my 20 some years in June, I've seen a moose at the visitor center area once, and then a few more times than that wolves. But by far, bears, salmon, and porcupine are our most commonly spotted wildlife with a fair number of eagles coming through too. The viewing platforms we have make for fantastic wildlife viewing, and that is one of the main goals of many of the people who come out to see us at Mendenhall. And our trails are also great for wildlife viewing, but the platforms provide easy access. So why would bears be here? So one of the great things about Alaska in general is that Alaska is full of abundant food for bears and there's a lot of great habitat for them. In Juneau in particular, we have great salmon streams that bears spend a lot of time at in the late summer and in the fall. And you can see this bear intently looking into the creek, probably ready to jump in and catch a fish. So what types of bears are we likely to see? In the Juneau area, there's a possibility of two kinds of bears. Um, black bears are much more commonly seen than brown bears. And one of the important things is to know how to tell these bears apart. And one of the reasons that's important is it gives you a sense of how the bear might react in a given situation. So how do you tell a black bear from a brown bear? Take a quick look at these photos, and for those of you who've lived here a while, you probably have a good sense of it. One way to tell is to look at those shoulders. On a brown bear, they've got this big muscular hump. They build those muscles. They're perfect for digging in the ground. Another feature to look at is the claws on the bear. Or hopefully you're not too close to see them up close. Maybe you're using binoculars. On a brown bear, those claws tend to be more straight and they're perfect for digging. On a black bear, they tend to be more curved, great for helping them climb trees. When you look at their faces, on a black bear, that line from the forehead to the snout tends to be more straight, kind of like a collie, if you want to picture a dog. And on a brown bear, it tends to be a little more concave, a little more dish-shaped, and you could picture a Rottweiler or a Golden Retriever to get a sense of that face shape. So those are details you can use to tell the bears apart. What you probably don't wanna actually use is the color. So even though we call them black bears and brown bears, color is probably the worst way to tell them apart. Black bears can be black, they can be brown. In some areas, they're really kind of white or cream color. They could be black with a pale colored mohawk down their back. The color really varies. And brown bears vary too. They can be a brown, they can be almost black, they can be a pale straw color. So in spite of the names, color is not the best way to tell them apart. 
So bears have one super important job in life, and that is to eat. Eating is important to help them survive, of course, and for the females, getting enough food is really important to help them reproduce. Uh, bears mate in the early summer, and the egg will start to divide, so start to create a small bunch of cells called a blastocyst. But if that female doesn't get enough food during the course of the summer, that pregnancy is terminated and that bear is not able to, excuse me, not able to reproduce that year. So what do they eat? Bears are super opportunistic omnivores. They are happy to eat just about anything that comes their way that they find. They will eat berries. And in this photo, you can see the devil's club berries. I've seen black bears nibbling them off. They eat grasses and sedges. Um, it's not unusual for us at Mendenhall to see bears grazing on the sedges and grasses in the early part of the summer. Some years, dandelions are a big hit. They'll also go after mammals, so things like moose and deer, if they can catch them or if they're roadkill, the bears will happily eat them. And some of the foods that they like are ones that we as people tend to really like and try to harvest too, things such as blueberries and salmon. So if you're out looking for blueberries or salmon, you might have a higher likelihood of running into a bear. So that brings us to bear viewing areas. Because Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center has a salmon creek, you know, it's a nice convenient spot. Bears tend to congregate here. And there are other places in the state that have a high reliable food source. And when that happens, bears tend to like to be, uh, let me rephrase that, they're a little more comfortable being near each other than they otherwise would be. They tend to be pretty solitary. When that happens, of course, people who want to see bears tend to go to these bear viewing areas. At Mendenhall, our views are a little different than this, but one feature we share with this image is this fence you see along the left side of the photo that kind of provides a way to give the people a way to stay separated from the bears. And what it does for the bears is it provides them some predictability in our behavior as people. So if you're thinking about viewing bears, what are the best practices? What's the best way to go about it? One of the really important things to think about and consider is to leave all your food and your beverages in a designated area, or if you don't have a designated area in your backpack, and to always keep those belongings you have with you under your control. This is important because we don't want bears to have a chance to get human food. Human food. They're smart animals. If they get human food, it's pretty easy for them to associate human food with humans. And while you yourself may not see the effect of a bear getting your crumbs or snagging something from your backpack, that next visitor could be the one who suffers the result of a bear that becomes used to humans and getting human food. Another good practice is to move slowly and quietly in designated areas that are open to travel where the bears expect to see you. And part of that's keeping yourself predictable and not startling the bear. Stay together in a group and allow the bears to move around you in their intended direction. So here at Mendenhall on Steep Creek Trail, the part that stays open in the summer when the salmon are running is all enclosed in fences. So it's pretty easy for us to stay within that zone. But if you get off of Steep Creek Trail and go out on our other trails, you still have a chance of encountering bears. When that happens, keep your group together. And if that bear wants to cross the trail, give it space and allow it to go where it needs to go. And this is one that people don't always think about, but it's a good idea to leave your dog and your bicycle at home. Dogs uh, can do a couple different things. The presence of a dog, the barking of a dog can raise the stress level of a bear. And then also, if your dog is off leash, it may run off to the bear, agitate the bear, and bring that bear back to you, which is not a result that any of us want. And with bicycles, if you're moving faster through a trail system, you have a greater likelihood of startling the bear and not giving it enough time to react as it hears you coming. And really the bears, they use our trails. Just imagine you've got the woods out here. If you've walked through the woods, the trails are much easier to walk on. And bears, you know, easy food, easy walking spaces, they'll go for it. 
So when you see a bear on the trail, give them space, don't approach them. So along with best practices and closely related are wildlife viewing ethics, bear viewing ethics. So as you are going through a bear viewing area, move slowly, move cal sound calmly, be calm. Avoid loud noises and don't use flash photography. This is part of keeping bears calmer, keeping your fellow viewers calmer, and just making for a better viewing situation. We want to be predictable to the bear. It helps them stay less stressed. Another important ethical matter is learning to recognize and respect wildlife alarm signals. When an animal changes its behavior as a result of your presence, you're too close. So an example, let's say if it was a porcupine, if you're near a porcupine and it turns its back to you and raises its quills, that's telling you you are too close. In a bear viewing area, one of your signals that you are either too close or maybe too loud is if a bear's been grazing, it's just kind of doing its bear thing and it stops and it looks at you when you've made a noise or done something, that's its signal that it's a little bit uncomfortable with what you're doing. And giving bears space, give all wildlife space. In a bear viewing area, you know, like Steep Creek, we have a fence on our platforms. So it's pretty easy to feel comfortable up on that fence platform. But something to think about while you're watching bears is not leaning over the fence, not encroaching into their space, either with your body, with your camera lens, or with a selfie stick. And this is a particularly tricky thing for folks to remember, but important when bears do things like walk underneath the viewing platforms. They're closer to us at that point. And we wanna make sure we don't cause them any undue stress. This one's really important. Let animals eat their natural foods. The foods that they can find in the wild are the foods that can give them the nutrition they need. And it's also the foods that are gonna keep them safer once bears have a chance to get into human food and associate people with human food, it oftentimes comes to a bad end for the bear. And this is probably one of the most important things when you're at a bear viewing area and will make you a better companion at a bear viewing area. Be sure to share that experience. While you're there watching the bear and enjoying its natural behavior in that quiet setting, Take a look over your shoulder periodically and see if someone else is there and give them a chance to look. It might be someone who is seeing their very first bear ever and they're super excited and you want them to have that fantastic experience. Maybe you've watched the bear for five minutes and someone else has just walked up. Yield the ground, give them an opportunity to share in that joy. So I'm gonna talk take this um, uh, section of slides here. There's a story behind this photo. Here we have a group of folks who are on the Kenai River and they are at a campground there. Um, they have been approached by this young brown bear. This is a brown bear. And uh, we'll talk about potentially why this young brown bear approached um, this group of people in a little bit. But um, basically, what happened was this group of people saw the bear coming and they started to walk away. They started to quickly walk away and a ranger on the other side of the river got their attention and said, no, 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 group up, put your hands in the air, appear bigger than you are and stand your ground and face the bear. Well, they all did that. And this is a picture of them doing so. Uh, this is exactly what you should do in the situation where a bear takes an interest in you and starts to approach you. In the end, what this bear did lost interest in the group, decided that it didn't really want to get engaged with them, turned around and walked away. So this is an example, pretty much literally, exactly what you would want to do in the same situation. Um, and like I said, in a minute here, we'll talk about why this, this young bear may have done what it did. We're gonna segue a little bit from uh, viewing bears in a, in a bear viewing setting and into what you might wanna consider uh, when you're out uh, hiking or when you are encountering bears in, in, a, in a wilder setting. The big thing to remember here is that bears in a bear viewing setting or bears in an area where humans are frequent, uh, they have become a 
little bit, they have neutral feelings potentially associated with the presence of humans. In other words, like Lori said, they're, they're less likely to change their behavior in the presence of humans. They're most likely to just do what bears do. And in that situation, people can get a little bit closer. But I'm going to talk a little bit about how to have a positive outcome should you encounter a bear um, just in anywhere in Alaska or, or, or beyond Alaska for that matter. The big thing that we say is stay aware and be prepared. The first thing you can do, and this is different than bears in a bear viewing area, is you do want to make noise. You want to let that bear know where you are. Most bears have, they don't want to have anything to do with humans. And when you make noise, you alert that bear as to not only what you are, but where you are. There is nothing in nature that sounds like the human voice. A lot of people will carry bells or uh, play music on their cell phone as they're hiking down the trail, and that's okay too, but there's nothing that identifies you as human rather than your voice. So you wanna make noise when you're moving through the woods. You wanna carry bear spray. This is very important. Carry bear spray and have it handy. That bear spray will do you no good if it's buried in your backpack. So what does have it handy mean? It means carrying it in a holster across your front. Maybe it's right on your hip. Uh, I'm a runner and I like to carry my bear spray across the small of my back. And there's, there's a lot of different carriers out there that you can choose that might fit your needs best. But the bigger thing is have it handy. And you know, what I should add to this is know how to use it. Bear spray is a lot like a firearm. If you would not wanna be carrying a firearm around with you unless you had practiced how that firearm functions. Same with bear spray. Uh, basically, bear spray comes in a canister. I'll use my water bottle as a prop. Bear spray comes in a canister and uh, it has a trigger on the top and you would wanna support it with, with your lower hand. There's a safety on that, you would pull that safety off. Now, when you aim that bear spray, which is uh, inside the canister, it's filled with capsicum, which is a very dense and nasty pepper mixture. It will aggravate the mucous membrane of any an mammal, really. Us, bears, wolves, moose, you name it. But because that animal would be approaching you from the ground, uh, the bear spray is going to want to be directed in a downward direction. And I always tell people to spray it one 1,000 or two 1,000. And you want to create a wall that that animal has to go through to get to you. And... Um, Bear spray has an expiration date on it. Always make sure to check that. We can talk a little bit more about bear spray at the end if folks have more questions, or you can email me directly. But definitely carry it and have it handy. Whenever you're moving in an area that is either loud because you're right next to a creek, or you're moving through an area that's heavily brushy, maybe the trail is really narrow and uh, your field of view is not very far, very well. Um, you don't have a long field of view rather, or maybe you're moving in an area that has a lot of blind corners. Make sure that you're cautious, make sure that you're aware. And if you are along a creek, that noise that you're making is going to want to be loud enough to be heard above the noise of the water. Always travel in a group when you're in bear country. I, I really, <clears throat> you'll hear us say this many times, <laughs> and that's because we really can't stress it enough. Traveling in a group is not only safer because you make more noise, but if you do encounter a bear, like we saw in that original image, uh, it's easier for you to look larger, to really let that bear know that, hey, you know, you, you just wanna go the other way. And make sure that when you're walking on a trail, you don't spread out, you do wanna stick together. As Lori said, it's, pets really can just cause problems in bear country. And so if you are out in the wild on a hiking trail, <clears throat> away from it all, we do really recommend that you leash your pet or just leave it beh behind at home, which is a hard thing to do, I know, but what can happen is that that pet can aggravate the bear in ways that the bear may not otherwise be aggravated and, and make a, an otherwise pretty basic situation um, worse, potentially. And then another thing is use your senses. Use that sense of smell, use that eyesight, use your hearing. Uh, make sure that all your senses are available to you while you're out on the trail. I know headphones are a handy thing to have when you're out on a long run or a long bike ride or a hike that you've done a thousand times before, but pull them out and plug into nature. If you smell something off that 
could smell kind of nasty. It could be something dead. And if you're in bear country, it could be uh, a cached kill that a bear had buried to come back to feed on later. Um, if you smell that, also look to the trees. Are there birds around? Are they circling? Are they all gathering uh, around a specific area? These are clues that you can pick up on. If you're near a salmon stream, are the salmon in? Does it smell like dead salmon? You know, all things like this. And uh, the last thing I always mention is spidey senses. So we all have that extra sense that I can never explain myself, but it's that sense that you get when you're driving down a road and you think to yourself, maybe I should slow down a little bit. There might be a cop around this corner. So you do, and sure enough, there's that cop that you, oh wow, I'm glad I listened to that. That's extra sense. And that's the same sense that maybe sends the, the hairs on the back of your neck up a little to kind of prickle up. And, and listen to that too. That's telling you something. So again, stay aware, be prepared. Some other clues that you can uh, kind of key in on when you're out on the trails are signs that could be left behind by bears. So on the right hand side, those are bear scratchings on a uh, on a tree, this is a, it looks like it's in the interior, but bears will scratch and rub on trees to mark territory and alert bears that they were there. Uh, that's a bear track obviously there in the upper left corner and that happens to be a brown bear track. So Lori mentioned earlier how to tell bears apart and looking at tracks can help give you a clue as to not only what bear walked by, but when. This looks like it's a pretty fresh track and in this case, this happens to be a brown bear. How can you tell? Well, as, as Lori mentioned, the claws on a, on a brown bear are, are, have a gentler curve to them, which means that when that bear presses down in the mud, those claw indents are gonna be further out from the toe pads. Uh, if this were a black bear paw print, they'd be a little bit closer. Also, the toes make almost a straight line from front toe to, I'll call it the pinky toe, even though that's not the official term a black bear paw, those toes are gonna to be more of a crescent shape. You can also see, was that fresh in the mud or maybe has it rained on that track? So things to think about. And then down below is, is a scat pile made by a bear and um, it's always good to take a look and, in, and look at that scat pile. Are there flies on it? If so, it's probably a little fresher than not. Uh, if you are bold, you can actually put your hand right over it and see if it's still warm. If it's a little bit decrepit and maybe looks like it's been there a while, maybe it's dried out, it's probably not as fresh um, as, and so maybe it's a couple of days old. But these are clues to help you understand, you know, when you are in bear country and when you should perk up your senses a bit. So your behavior influences the outcome of a bear encounter. Let me say that again. Your behavior influences the outcome of a bear encounter. Um, Always stay calm, don't panic, and never run from a bear. That's easier said than done. When you see a bear, first thing I recommend you do is take a couple deep breaths, assess the situation. What is this bear doing? How is it behaving? Does the bear notice you? If not, have your deterrent with you, keep your eyes on the bear, and move away in the direction that you came. Let the bear keep doing what it wants to be doing and is doing. If the bear does notice you, that's okay, but stop. Ready that deterrent, face the bear. If you're in a group, ideally you are, you wanna to group together, just like that image, and you want to help the bear understand what you are. Talk to the bear in a calm voice. You're not a threat, you're just walking this trail, happen upon this bear. This is us bear, here we are. If the bear, just stands there, you want to move away in the direction that you came. Again, keeping your eyes on the bear. Now I'm going to change gears here a little bit. And in those situations, the ones that I just went over, you run into a bear, the bear does its bear thing, you move on doing what you were going to do. That is 99.9% .9 of, of bear uh, encounters. Why can I say that with confidence? It's because we don't hear about them. The ones that we hear about are the ones where the behavior or the interaction is of note. And so I'm gonna go over the two types of that. There are two <clears throat> types of bears that you may encounter where the behavior changes as a result of your presence. 
There's defensive bear behavior, and then we'll talk about non-defensive in a minute. But what, what's a defensive bear? A defensive bear is one that maybe you surprise, uh, maybe one that you got too close to. A bear with cubs really doesn't like people to get very close at all. They like a lot of personal space. Or maybe it's a bear that's on a carcass, and so therefore um, it feels threatened. In all those situations, the bear would feel threatened. I like to talk a little bit about, it's not too dissimilar from us. You know, I have two young kids, and if a stranger was getting a little close to me, I would I would probably prickle a little bit and tell that person, excuse me, excuse me, you need to back off. Or maybe I hadn't eaten all day and I was really hungry, probably a little cranky, and I felt like someone might be taking my meal away from me. I'm not going to react well to that. Or like all of us do, if someone comes up behind us and surprises us, we're going to react in a way we otherwise wouldn't. Bears are not too dissimilar. Their behavior, though, is something to look for. Uh, if any of these situations happen, the bear will, it's going to let you know. It's going to huff and stomp, maybe it's paws or hoo, hoo. It's going to make a popping sound with its teeth, salivate, lay its ears back. It may charge at you, but then veer off before making contact. Now, these are all the behaviors that the bear might do. It might do all of them. It might do one. It might do none. But the important thing to know is that these are some of the behaviors that may be exhibited in a defensive bear. Again, it feels threatened. Your job is to help it understand you're not a threat in this situation. So switching gears here a little bit, there are also non-defensive bear um, encounters. In this situation, a non-defensive bear may approach you. It may approach you because you're on its travel route or maybe it's a young, it doesn't know what you are yet, so it's getting a little bit closer to see what you are and figure out what you're about. It may be a young bear trying to test its dominance. Oh, what's this? I'm gonna maybe test it out and push its buttons a little bit. It may be food conditioned, like Lori said. Uh, bears that have learned to associate with humans with food may approach humans boldly, looking for another free meal. Or potentially, sometimes they could be predatory. Now. Some behaviors to look for, again, some, not all, may be exhibited. They will approach usually silent. Uh, their ears may be up. The eyes are likely focused on you intently, and their, their approach will be deliberate, maybe persistent. Um, they may circle you. Now, um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here and talk about how, um, how to react if you run into these types of situations. Here's the good news. For the most part, your reaction to these different types of bears is exactly the same. Right out of the gate, when you encounter bears like this, first thing you wanna do is stop, absolutely, and assess the situation. Next thing you wanna do is ready your deterrent, okay? You wanna make sure that that is ready and that, again, you know how to use it. <clears throat> you want to alert the bear as to what you are. Use a calm voice, and if you're in a group, group up. Always watch the bear. This is your chance to establish what kind of bear behavior is being exhibited by that bear. Okay, if, if you have a defensive bear, you're gonna to continue to talk calmly to it. Again, in that situation, you don't wanna be a threat, so you wanna lower the stress level. However, if that defensive bear gets into your comfort zone and it's within range of a, of a bear deterrent, which is 15 to 30 feet or so, it's okay to deploy that deterrent. That alerts the bear, okay, you know, you've come close enough to me. Um, and uh, so that's, that's what you would do next if that bear got into your personal space. Now, if a non-defensive bear approaches you and continues to approach you, you want to up your game. Now, this is that bear that is displaying behavior that, that where the bear does not feel threatened at all by your presence. You wanna up your game. You wanna, Change your voice from calm to, hey bear, no, hey, get out of here bear. You could bang sticks on the ground, you could throw some rocks, maybe not directly at the bear initially, but again, as that, if that bear continued to come at you, you wanna to continue to up your game to drive that bear off. Letting it know, you don't wanna mess with me bear. Now, if it continues to approach you, it gets in your personal space, that's when you would deploy your deterrent. Okay, now, <clears throat> if a bear makes contact with you and um, that's where they actually physically make 
connection with you. In a defensive bear attack, uh, what will happen if they, if they knock you to the ground, you want to protect yourself. First thing you wanna do is protect yourself. You wanna lie face down with your hands clasped behind your neck. You wanna spread your legs and elbows. The idea there is that you don't wanna be rolled over by the bear. This is a really hard part, again, because you are trying to not be a threat to this bear. You want to remain still, you don't want to fight back, and you want to not cry out. You want to say, bear, I am not a threat to you, I am not, I am not, and you want to remain that way until the bear retreats. This is a very hard one <clears throat> because you want to wait there longer than you think is necessary. If you get up too soon after you think the bear has retreated, it may come back and knock you down again because it says, oh, you're still a threat? Well, let me just put you back down on the ground then. Um, so this is how you would react. Again, it's important that you, you simply de-escalate as best you can. And here's what it looks like, uh, that position that I mentioned. If you have a backpack, we always recommend that you keep the backpack on. Now, if a bear makes contact with you that does not appear defensive, you aggressively want to fight off by any means possible. And you want to focus on the, the muzzle area. You want to focus on the eyes and the nose and <clears throat> the, the face in general. And, and really, I mean, fight back as, as you can with any means possible. Again, I will say predatory attacks are very rare, uh, but it, it's always nice to know what to do just in case. So with, here, with this one, I'm gonna hand it back to Lori and uh, let's do a little review, shall we? All right, now in this part, I'm gonna invite you to put comments in the chat. So in review, what do you do when you encounter a defensive bear? So you're gonna stop and assess the situation, just like Abby was saying. You're gonna make sure your deterrent is ready. You're gonna keep your voice calm and keep your group together. And you're gonna keep your eyes on that bear. You're gonna watch what it's doing and not run away from it. And then if necessary, if that bear approaches you and gets in your personal space, you'll deploy your deterrent. Um, I wanna give a side note about deterrence. When you are in a wildlife viewing area, especially a bear viewing area, the bears will naturally come closer to you than they, than they tend to do when you're out in a more wild zone out on the trail system. So keep that piece in mind it's pretty unusual to get a very defensive bear in a wildlife viewing area unless you are encroaching in that bear's space. So what about bears that are not defensive? Then what do you do? Like defensive bears, you stop and assess the situation. You make sure you have your deterrent ready at hand. You keep your voice calm, you keep your group together, and you watch the bear to see what it's doing and you hold your ground. But if that bear that's not being defensive, it's not, doesn't seem too worried about you, keeps approaching you, that's when you're gonna up your game. Just like Abby said, you're gonna get louder, you're gonna clap your hands, you're gonna be more assertive in your voice, maybe stomp your feet do whatever it takes to deter that bear. And then again, is that last resort, if it gets too close, deploy your deterrent. So what about being out and about in bear country, which is most of the state? What if you're gonna go hiking, camping, biking? What do you need to do and know to be aware and be prepared? So we just covered a lot of good general information about bears to kind of keep that wrapped up in the back of your mind. If you're doing these things, you're gonna have a less likely of a chance to encounter a bear in the wild. So when you're hiking, this is similar to when you're going boating, make a plan, make sure somebody knows where you're going and when you plan to return. When you're out on that hike, look around you, look for the bear sign that we mentioned earlier are there trees with scratches on it? Is there scat on the ground? Does it appear to be fresh? Are there tracks around you? Those are all cues that you might be near a bear. In your bear spray, make sure again that it's not hidden away back in your backpack. 
that you have it somewhere that you can grab it at a moment's notice if you need it. And then again, with traveling in groups, the bigger your group, the more likely you are to be loud and give bears more advanced notice of your presence. And it decreases the chance that you're gonna encounter a bear. When you're out on a hike, keep your pets close and under your control so they don't go out and agitate a bear and possibly bring one back to you. And then as a good courtesy, if you do see a bear when you're out hiking, let other hikers know that you've seen one and kind of pass that information along. And then out here at Mendenhall, we actually really appreciate it when our hikers, when our visitors stop and tell us when they saw a bear and where they saw a bear and was it a mother with cubs. That helps us keep an eye on what's going on in our situation. Because even though we are outside, we are not all places at once. And with that, I'll turn this back over to Abby. Thanks, Laurie. So yeah, mountain biking. Mountain biking. I went ahead of myself here. Let's back right up. Mountain biking is a sport that is growing in popularity all over Alaska. I know in Juneau, it's grown quite a bit over the past few years. But with mountain biking, it's high speed and high risk. It's a lot actually like mountain running, going at a higher speed, higher risk. Uh, when you are mountain biking, you want to make sure that, of course, you have bear spray, but make sure it's attached to your body. The last thing you would want to do is have that bear spray on your bike, but somehow be separated from your bike in the event of a bear encounter. Perhaps you're knocked off your bike, your bike rolls away, falls away from you. The last thing you want to have to do is move uh, to, to get at that, that deterrent. Chances are you just simply won't have time to do so. Make sure that when you are mountain biking, that when the salmon are running, you avoid trails near salmon streams. This is true in areas like Anchorage especially. A lot of those frequently used biking trails in Anchorage go right alongside salmon streams. And it's important that, especially when the salmon are in, to avoid those areas. Because you are moving at a higher speed, really slow down at blind corners and make noise. Watch for bear sign, like you would if you were hiking. It's okay to use noisemakers on your bike to help with that noise. Of course, don't wear headphones and like these, these folks are doing here in this, in this photo, make sure to ride in groups. Uh, we do, in Juneau, have more people using, using the Dredge Lakes trails, which is directly adjacent to the Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center area. And so it's natural that those bears will also use those trails. That trail system is increasing. And what we're hearing is that there are a lot of local bikers using those trails, which is fantastic, but they're also bringing their canine friends along with them. In this situation, again, it's really best that those dogs are left at home, especially in an area, of course, where you are more likely to run into bears like dredge lakes. So safety around the home. <clears throat> As I showed in those earlier slides, Juno is smack dab in the middle of bear country, as is Anchorage, as is a lot of other communities in, uh, in Alaska. And so it's important that we do our part to make sure that bears do not gain access to, to human attractants. And those attractants can be anything from pet food to bird seed. Bird seed really is one of those things where, you know, it's nice to watch birds all through the year, but in the spring, summer, and fall months, there's plenty of natural foods available for birds and they really don't need that extra protein. And so during those summer months, spring and fall, really do put those bird feeders away because as soon as bears see that, they'll key, on, key in on it and come back again and again. It really is an easy meal for them. Of course, trash can be an issue as well if not secured properly. And in many communities in Alaska, it is against the law. Uh, well, rather, there's an, a, a state ordinance that uh, it, if you were to even unintentionally uh, let a bear uh, into your trash, you could be cited. But then there's also many city ordinances in place that uh, you could get a, a citation as well. Juno has one, um, Petersburg has one, you know, um, Haynes has one. A lot of communities have an ordinance in place. Uh, fish scraps this time of year, people are harvesting salmon and that's fantastic, but salmon and crab tend to be pretty smelly if left in your garbage can over the course of the week while you're waiting for your automatic trash pickup to come, or if you're in an area where you don't dispose of your own trash on a regular basis, it's good to take fish scraps 
and crab scraps and freeze them until you are ready to dispose of them. And of course, chickens. We have had a lot of folks very interested in uh, sustainable food sources and chickens with their amazing uh, farm fresh eggs are one of them, but they do provide an attractant to bears. We recommend that chickens are secured with an electric fence. We're also finding that it's not just the chickens that the bears go after, but also the chicken feed. So make sure that the bulk of the chicken feed is stored in a secure structure. I know that some of you, for some of you, this is like, yeah, I know, I know. But again, you know, it all goes back to the wildlife safety piece because if bears become food conditioned by gaining access to this, they do become um, a safety issue for neighborhoods. And quite frankly, it doesn't end well for the bear typically. So how can you keep them out of reach? Well, keep your trash inside a secure structure, but if you can't, that's okay. In most communities, you can upgrade to a bear resistant can. This is what they look like in Juneau and Anchorage. Now, I wanna stress that bear resistant cans are not bear proof. They are effective, however, if they are used correctly and the mechanisms are well maintained. Uh, we have a lot of freeze thaw cycles in our communities. And so make sure to keep that mechanism in working order. And if you have a problem with it, go ahead and call up your waste company and get them to come out and either replace the can or fix the mechanism. This is great. This shows the div not only the diversity, the ingenuity, but the opportunistic nature of bears. What you're about to see is a video that was taken off of some uh, uh, GPS collars that were affixed to bears in the Anchorage area. They also had video cameras on them, and it really does show the diversity of what bears can do and find. The other thing about this is you'll see that they're, they're not only smart in what they can get into, but in this case, you can see that this, this black bear is also teaching her cubs the same thing, uh, which you know only will perpetuate the problem down the road. Bears can sense when an electric fence is live. They don't even have to touch it, they can sense it. So they really are effective. Here we are, some bears getting into some dog food, I think. Yeah, a boat hatch, sure, why not? Luckily, this particular food storage container was uh, empty, but we do have some folks who store their freezers on their porch because they simply run out of room in their garage or in their house. And if that's the case, that freezer really has to be secured because even if that Food inside is frozen. Bears have such a great sense of smell, they still will be able to sense that it's in there and they'll try to get at it. Okay, we've talked a lot about bears tonight. And uh, so let's shift gears just briefly and talk about two other species. We're gonna start with moose. And as Lori said, moose are occasionally seen at the Mendenhall Glacier. Uh, we do see them here in Juneau, out north of town near Burners Bay, where there is a pretty healthy population that is slowly making its way toward town. In Anchorage, moose are, I don't want to say a common occurrence, but they are not uncommon by any means. They can be very dangerous. They are actually more unpredictable than bears, and there are more negative moose-human interactions in Alaska than there are with bears. This uh, photo it shows a very dangerous situation with moose, a cow with calves. In the spring, um, it is common to see cows with very young calves, and they will bend these calves fiercely without very little warning or provocation. Basically, if you see a moose with this kind of posture, <laughs> the hackles are raised, the ears are back. This is a very upset moose, and it's important that you immediately leave the area rather quickly. Uh, if this moose were to, this is telling you this moose is about to charge you, and moose are huge. And you don't want a moose coming at you with its hooves flailing. So if a moose does charge, you want to run. You want to do the opposite of what you would do with a bear. You want to run as fast as you can and quickly put something, anything in between you and that moose. You really, whether it's a car or a bush or a fence, put something in between you and that animal. Sometimes the moose will kind of play peekaboo with you, but chances are it'll calm down and walk away. Wolves. Wolves have been seen in, in the past at the Mendenhall Glacier. I don't think one lorry has been seen in recent years, but they do show up. Uh, wolves are a species that um, is all over Alaska. 
And in the case of a wolf encounter, if it's one where the wolf is approaching you, like this wolf is doing, you would you react in this situation the same as you would react in a non-defensive bear encounter. So immediately stop, stand your ground, look at that wolf. It's okay to make eye contact and let that wolf know that you mean business. Immediately up your game. Say, hey, get out of here, get out of here. And uh, if the wolf continues to approach, if you have deterrent, use it, absolutely. If you don't, begin to just, you know, try to get that wolf out of there as, as best you can, throw rocks, use sticks, people have used ski poles. Um, but uh, for the most part though, wolves are a very unique sighting, uh, regardless of where you are. And uh, what I always tell people is, look quickly because chances are they're gonna be gone just as fast as they showed up. So with that, we're gonna be wrapping up our presentation tonight. I always tell people that this is a very handy slide to take a photo of with your cell phone. If you have a device where you can capture a screenshot, do that because there's some really important numbers on here. Who do you call? Well, if a human life is being threatened by a bear, 911. There's no question about that. If you're at the Mendenhall Glacier, like Lori said, they wanna know if you see bears. You can call, that's the main line right there, or you can find a ranger and let them know what you saw. If, if you have a bear that it's um, maybe acting aggressive toward you, uh, maybe it is getting into attractants repeatedly, it's okay to call Fish and Game. We do wanna hear about that. Our main line is there. Our hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30. You can also email our area biologist, Roy Churchwell. His email's there. Now, if this is after hours, uh, we do recommend you call the Juno Police Department and they'll get a hold of us. You can also call the troopers and they can respond. Troopers respond in situations where uh, maybe there's not a police department to respond to calls like this. Or if you happen to see a wolf or you happen to see a moose, maybe in an area that you've never seen one before, please let us know online at our 24-7 uh, reporting line at uh, adfg.alaska.gov. Before I move on, Laurie, is there anything you wanted to say about this slide? You know, at the Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center, we are here at various hours on different days of the week. If you don't get one of us right away, please do leave a message. Um, like Abby said, we're very curious about what you see as far as the bears and when and where you see them. And yeah, seek us out when you see us outside and share your experiences with us. All right, so here we are. You can also go ahead and take a screenshot of this, this slide as well. If you, I have been recording this presentation, so if you would like a copy of it to share far and wide, please do let us know. Uh, if you have more questions that you didn't uh, wanna ask tonight or you think of questions later, here's our contact information. Please feel free to contact us. We're happy to share information about bears or wildlife safety, anything really in general. And um, it really has been a pleasure tonight presenting to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Lori, did you wanna say anything? Thank you guys all for coming. Um, feel free to throw out some questions in the chat if you'd like at the end here. We've got a couple more minutes and I wish you all safe and happy wildlife viewing. <laughs> all right, with that, we'll open it up for questions. Like Lori said, we, right, right are, we are right at just about an hour. So if you have to go, we understand, but we'll hang out for a bit. Thank you. We're getting some good feedback in the chat. Thanks everyone. All right, we had a whole family join us. That's so good. It's great to share this information with young and old. I'll throw out a quick tip while people are signing off. If you're still on and you're wondering about wildlife viewing, think about what foods bears like to eat at different times of the year, and that'll give you cues on where to be more aware of them or the potential to see them when you're out and about. Like out here at Mendenhall, for example, of course, when the salmon are in in mid to late summer and early fall, Steep Creek's a great place to watch them, but some years, in the early summer, like May, when the cottonwood seed pods are being set, maybe even early June, sometimes we see our black bears up our cottonwood trees. And if you're ever out here and you see some really rough looking cottonwood trees, you have the bears and the porcupines to thank for the shape of those trees.
I did have a question just come in. Is anyone studying the progeny of our Mendenhall bears? Well, right now we don't have any active research happening. We have had bears collared in the Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center area in past years. Um, they were GPS collars and we did learn a lot about where these bears, well, let me back up. What we learned is that a lot of female bears frequent that area, the area around Steep Creek with their cubs. We're not exactly sure why, but we do believe that because of the presence of humans, a lot of tourists in the summer, that that deters the presence of male bears. And male bears can be a danger to cubs. And so we think that potentially the females are there with their cubs because it's a safer spot. What we learned is that um, they have denning areas that are not too far from uh, the, the Glacier Visitor Center, which is pretty cool. And, um, you know, beyond that, I think that we did publish a paper about the Mendenhall Valley Bears. Uh, all of our published works are available on the Fish and Game Publications database. If you want more information, send me an email and I can dig around and see if I can't dig up some research papers that will give you exactly what you're looking for. Um, I think there, I think we did publish a paper on that. It would, would have been early 2000. Good question. Okay. Well, everyone, it's eight o'clock on the nose. Thanks so much. I wanna, how do you know if it's a bear den? Oh, good question. Well, the GPS collars stay on the bears for over a year, often ideally, um, if, the, if the bear, if the collar fits well, if it functions well, um, if the bear, you know, lives for the duration of the time the collar's on it, we'll stay on for a couple of years. And so what happens is as the bear is moving, the GPS uh, collar will record its position on a frequent and regular basis. But once the bear stops moving, that GPS collar stops recording. So what we know is that in the fall, we know when that bear has gone into the den and we know where that den is because that GPS position doesn't change and doesn't record again until that bear wakes up and begins to move again in the, uh, in the springtime. We have studied the, what bear dens look like most commonly on Prince of Wales Island. And um, bear dens do have um, some common characteristics. They will be in like the root wad of a big old old growth tree. Sometimes they will be uh, dug out depressions on the forest floor. They often are lined with spruce boughs or hemlock boughs or just leaves. Sometimes they're in um, you know, rock crevices in like a cave. And uh, so they're versatile and opportunistic with their dens, but there are some common characteristics like the ones that I just mentioned. Yeah, good question. Well, as we're wrapping up, Lori, I just wanna take a moment to say thank you so much for helping me out tonight. It's really been a pleasure to present with you. Thank you, Abby, I've enjoyed it too. And I enjoy always getting to hear other people present and uh, pick up more information and hear the questions people have. Absolutely. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you all. Have a great night.